Hello and welcome to Relatable. This is your host, Teresa Freeman. A quick reminder that Relatable is now sponsored by TFA Soft Skills. Check out our website at www.tfasoftskills.com for exciting information, tips, and services. In this next episode, I speak with Zach Davis. Zach is the owner of Fort Mix Martial Arts. Uh, Talking with Zach was such a pleasure. He, his authenticity and positivity and candor was so refreshing. We cover a lot of territory in our conversation. Uh, Zach talks about his path from being a professional fighter to owning his own mixed martial arts studio. We talk about his path to sobriety and the keys for sticking to a program even when your motivation is waning. And we also talk about his favorite soft skill and what he thinks is critical for your success. Enjoy this episode. Zach, tell me a little bit about your current business and what you're doing now. I know. Oh, it's yeah, so yeah. yeah. I'm excited. We just started up. Uh, I've been running martial arts school for a long time now. Um, and we just, uh, on the first of this year, transitioned. So it's I'm an owner now instead of uh, managing. Um, and it was, it, was a, it was a very s- smooth transition, as smooth as those things can be as you figure them out. But it was a, it was a natural process. Um, and it worked out well. Uh, I had worked in the field long enough. Um, and, you know, it, sometimes in those roles, you kind of outgrow the role. And I think a lot of people stay in that role for a long time. And it gets kind of painful. And I think that the natural uh, movement was for me to become an owner. And so uh, there's a lot of new things uh, with a with a young business that I'm I'm learning about. So right. uh, it's it's a challenge. And you know, we talked earlier about uh, having a positive mindset. And so a lot yeah. of times I, I will uh, focus on the fact that it's a it's a new challenge. It's something right. to to learn. It's a growth opportunity. Um, and those are the things, you know, sometimes when you are stressing about things, if you just reword it as a, a growth opportunity or something we're, we're figuring out, it, it makes you feel a little bit better, but it's still, it's still a little crazy. Um, there's, no, there's no script for uh, running a business, especially a new one. So uh, I'm learning and growing, but, uh, you know, we, we've been running that school for about eight years, but now it's, it's officially mine as of the first. So lots of new things going on. Well, congratulations. I know that's that's actually really exciting and something that you've been looking at for a long time to, to take that and make it your own, I think is fantastic. And I think it's so interesting to see, and we'll have to talk again, because I think your perspective of being there for that long and, and really being a leadership role and having aspirations to do this. And then what is that flip and what what does that change for you in the experience, right? When you when you become the business owner and then you have added responsibility and you're now responsible for other people in a way that you weren't in terms of employees, you know, it goes on and on. But I, I think there's parts of that that you'll find are exhilarating and there's a lot that that your impact and your legacy, right, as an owner and how that can, you know, the, the ripple effect of that, you know, not that probably very different from you leading the school to begin with, but I, it is just going to be really interesting to see how that evolves for you and changes. Yeah, I'm sure there'll be a, I might be singing a, a totally different tune in a year or two, but um, yeah. you know, I, I think as, as you get to that point where it's time to make a change, that's where people get stuck and they get almost bitter or resentful if they right. stay in a role too long. And, you know, I, I talk to this a lot of it with my employees and people is that as they reach a point, they might have, you know, you know, they want to make more money. They want more responsibility, but the role they're in doesn't, facilitate that and so maybe then it's time to graduate and do right. something different or right. to create a new role and so that's kind of what I, I ended up doing for myself is you know I've kind of maxed out what I can do in this role and if yeah. I want to do more I either have to start out on my own or take this over and and that's what happened and, and it because it made sense it wasn't too painful and you're said you said it's mixed martial arts right it remind yeah. me again the, the name right now is what the name uh, right now. the fort mixed martial arts Fort Mix Martial Arts. And so is it all mostly young adults that you work with, or do you work with people of all ages? All well, all ages, like four up to, I think our oldest is 65. So if you're in that range, you can push the, the, the envelope a little bit. We yeah. don't try to get me to work with the three-year-olds, but we tried that and that's, that's herding kittens. So um, yeah, 
the, the cool thing with that is every single day I get to see the full spectrum yeah. of, of people. So yeah. um, and just for me, one of the things I enjoy about it is that I have four and five year olds that are dealing with some sort of issue and mm -hmm. you know, what it is they're getting frustrated because somebody else wins. And then two hours later, I have an adult man, 40 years old, and you can see it's the same issue, but it's, it's all layered on top of all, you know, he's like, he's like, man, you know, I can't, I'm not getting better. And I don't know why, and maybe I should stop and do something. And it's really, he's having the same issue that four-year-old was two hours early, earlier, and you have to kind of break it down to them. And so it's one of the, the funnest things for me in, in martial arts is to see how kids are dealing with it and how as adults, you know, we have a lot of mechanisms. We're mature. We know how we work, but, but not that well. We still have that, that frustrated four-year-old in us. Um, and so it's, it's, it's very interesting to be able to see a cross section of people every single day. And how long have you been, uh, tell me a little bit about your journey to this point. So I know, um, well, first, uh, first, let me ask this question about mixed martial arts in terms of jujitsu and how that is that the same thing? Like, talk to me like I'm four years old and sort of explain. No, I got you. Me. See, there's a four year old always. In every, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> every moment. No, um, always. So, Mostly so it's me when I'm trying to learn about new things. So. <laughs> yes. Um, so mixed martial arts is, is right now people mainly think about it as, as a sport like the UFC. Yeah. But really, it's a catch all term. Mixed martial arts means a blend of martial arts. OK. And so different martial arts, you know, because they have different rules and different way they, they came up. Um, they function different. So boxing looks a lot different than wrestling because there's a different way to win, different rule set. So mixed martial arts takes all the different elements of the, of the different martial arts and trying to uh, make sure we're using the best of all of them. So our school has Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. We teach uh, kickboxing, we teach boxing. Uh, Muay Thai is a specific uh, type of it. Um, so we have different classes and the different styles. But really what we're trying to do is get the best of all of them, whatever works and bring it together rather than staying with a specific art. So uh, we do teach Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, uh, kickboxing, but the umbrella term is mixed martial arts. All right, good. And Cobra Kai, is that, uh, is that created more like registration? I'm wondering if it's like upping, it's like Top you know, Gun, you know, all these people went to the Navy after Top Gun, like, you know, is that I think there is some enthusiasm. A lot of my kids, they, they have this, I have, I have a Cobra Kai shirt. Yeah. And, um, and so a lot of kids like it's it. So um, good. They get excited about it. I, I think um, there are these ebbs and flows on what is cool and what's not, you yeah. know? So at some point, you know, uh, martial arts is the coolest thing in the world. And then I'm sure there'll be another thing that comes out and people are like, ah, oh, that's kind of dorky. And, okay. but we're on the upswing right now. Everybody loves it. Um, but yeah, so the kids are all excited and they, they usually want to learn the crane kick every so often. Yeah. Um, so if they do good. We'll, we'll, we mix that in sometimes. All right. So now tell me about your path to this point in terms of, I know, I think you did some professional um, MMA, right. Or some version of that. So just tell me about. I, like I did, I did everything. Yeah. I, 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 so, um, you know, in high school, I was in a, a magnet program. So I was a math science engineering kid. Okay. Um, so I went to college and I just didn't really feel passionate about much. You know, I, I, I went there for pre-med and I switched to engineering and I, by the end, I just ended up doing criminology, criminal justice. Cause that's what I had a ton of credits in, but really during college, I just kept, I joined the boxing club, the wrestling club. I created the jujitsu club. Like all I cared about was doing the martial arts and, and I was doing my classes in the meantime. Um, so I graduated with that and yeah, then it was ready to, you know, okay, time to go into the real world. Right. And so I was looking at becoming a police officer. You know, I was like, all right, this is criminal justice. It's a job. I can do it. Um, but I wasn't particularly passionate about it. So my thought was, I got some time now. I love martial arts. Let me do as much of this as I can. And as soon as, you know, whatever, two, three years in, you know, I can always put my application back in for the police department. Um, and so I, I kind of made a decision. It was actually after college, I traveled to Brazil um, mm -hmm. to do Brazilian jiu-jitsu. It was kind of like a, 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 a Mecca trip, you know, where I was like, all right, let's go to the origin yeah. of the martial arts and I'm going to learn some Portuguese. I'm going to be on the beach. And so it was almost like a spiritual thing. Um, and I was there for two months and training every day and drinking coconuts and, and having a good time. 
And I kind of made a decision. I was like, let me, let me give this a real hundred percent effort. Um, just for, for a while, let's see how that works. Right. See where it goes. And I can always, you know, I have my degree. I can, I can, I can do something else if I need to. And so I started doing that. And to me, I think it's actually kind of remarkable that if you really put all your time and energy into one thing, mm -hmm. uh, you can, you can pick up ground pretty quick. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think of it very, it's the industry of, of professional fighting is very similar to the music industry more than other, mm -hmm. other sports, because there's, there's not a specific uh, team or that you're trying to get recruited on. Um, you're just trying to get a promoter to pay you to fight on their show. <laughs> and so uh, if you work on your own and build up your skills and find out your weaknesses and all those things, you quickly separate yourself from the pack. Um, even if you're not that talented, like to start, if you, if you're in there every day, getting better, um, it'll, it'll, you'll progress quickly. And I think. Can I ask you something about that? Because I actually had something that I wanted to talk to you about. Oh, well, I thought it was going to be later, but now that what you're talking about is prompting this. Interest. I'm all over the place and, it, you know, do your best with me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm fascinated by the like world of an athlete in terms of the dedication, the discipline and the motivation component and how, and I know it's unique to each person. I do think though, the ability to sort of get up and try again and the get up, the get up and go of like, and to your point, you mentioned earlier, right. About giving up, like people getting discouraged and people wanting to see more progress or right. And so I'm curious what you think there, the ingredients are for somebody to be that disciplined or to be like, is it, is it because you had such an interest, right? And you loved it so much that that carried you, or is it, there's something, do you think in elite athletes, right? That's maybe a little bit different just to be straight. Like, is it just, you're not quite like everybody else that can like be that disciplined. I'm just curious when you're operating at that level, what it requires, but also what gets you to get there to do it. Um, that's a fantastic question. Um, I think, uh, <laughs> I think, I mean, I think if you were wired differently, you would do something different, right? So maybe you, you, you're an artist or something different, but, um, to me, it was, uh, I think most athletes are very competitive and, uh, you know, you can kind of, I think it's important to be reflective and introspective about why are you so competitive? Are right. you, and, and a lot of times it's a chip on the shoulder. And so sometimes it's important to kind of take a minute. I was like, why do I have this chip on the shoulder? Is it something, you know, with my parents or my, you know, it's important to understand that, but it's still there. Um, and so I think kind of lean into, I'm just understanding yourself better helps that. Um, now that can be kind of a double-edged sword where maybe you're so competitive that you can't work on something new. You can't go with somebody who will challenge you because it'll expose that you're not the best. Um, so this is kind of where sports psychology is huge. Right. Um, and for me, what helped a lot was trying to think of the bigger picture is that, you know, maybe there's somebody at my gym who's always difficult to, to spar with. And so I can avoid that person to protect my ego. But if I look at the bigger picture, I want to be able to beat everybody in the country or the world. Mm -hmm. And so I better start working on it here. And so if I, if I look at it that way, like this is a skill I'm going to need at the next level. And so I think that's kind of the big thing that helps people continue to progress. For me, um, I, I kind of always had a mantra that, that helped me was, was that I'm not good enough to cut corners. That helped me. So that when it was like getting up at 5.30 in the morning to go swim or run, those are kind of the painful things that you kind of have to get yourself to do. And you know, I think if you're, I think if you're very talented, you can, you can cut those corners and still get away with it, but eventually it'll catch up. But if you remind yourself and stay humble that I do have to do this, I do have to watch my diet very closely. I do have to take care of my nutrition and my supplements and stretch all those smaller things that aren't as sexy. Um, and so then you kind of fall in love with doing the, the little things right. Uh, to me, those are the things that add up and those separate people as they go further. So I guess a long way to, to answer the question, what separates, you know, 
yeah. you know, top athletes. And one of my favorites I've been watching, not, he's not my favorite, but I've been watching, I love watching him is the Tom Brady uh, documentary that's out now. And the same with the Michael Jordan one right. um, is you can watch what keeps them motivated because it's not money. It's not glory. They have the right. championship. They have the money. Um, right. And to me, it's usually they're in love with doing the, the small things correct. The, the, the habits precisely and not cutting corners. And so that they could, I'm sure they could still have a tremendous amount of success and sleep in a little bit here and there, but they are so in love with the idea that they don't cut corners. They don't right. uh, take any shortcuts that that's what continues to keep them at that level above. So along those lines, just for people that are physically active and maybe not an elite athlete, but you know, there's, you think about what like the diet and nutrition and fitness is like a billion dollar industry, right? I'm guessing, mm-hmm. it's not you know, multi. So, and it's all this like fits and starts, right? People start programs. They, it's the new year. It's like, Hey, I've got my new, you know, I got my new Apple watch yep. and I'm ready to count my steps. Right. And then like, you know, ultimately those things kind of go, they fail or they go by the wayside and it's right. There's just such a stat on people that can't seem to sustain that commitment. So what, what advice do you have? Like, what, what do you think works when you're trying to sustain that kind of momentum that you usually get, you know, at the beginning of the year, or when you're out trying to setting new ambitions for yourself? I think, I think like, I mean, what, what you talk about is kind of like a new habit. Right. Um, and a new habit is very difficult because we've, we have our rhythms that work very well and our body is used to that. And so we want to kind of maintain that. And so, you know, the body wants to like, okay, we're just, we have the status quo. This is how, how much I eat. This is how much I exercise. Right. And so to adjust that is, is difficult on the body because you're using the willpower to change the body and the body, you know, it's, it's pretty, it's, it, it's got about, I don't know, 90% of the vote. And so the willpower kind of holds on for a little bit, but to me, what, what, what I, I, I find is a twofold approach is that you can use the willpower to get started, but what you really got to take a look at is why, um, why you, I don't know, kind why of lose weight. Why do I want to lose weight? Right. Um, and if you have kind of a superficial or shallow reason, which, you know, usually it's like, I want to look good in a bathing suit in the summer, right? right? That, you know, is a driving, a lot of people really do want that. And, and that might carry them a month to the end of January, <laughs> but eventually they're like, screw it. I'm not going to go to the beach then. And then I can right. eat for the next five months <laughs> because that, yep. that reason is, is strong, but it's kind of, it's kind of shallow. It's, it's empty. And so the things that I think generally work well is if you like, okay, let me come up with a, a, a deeper reason for me that I would want to make this change. Um, and so that's usually like, some, to me, it's like, okay, I want to be there for my children. So I want to make healthier decisions. Mm-hmm. I want to maybe um, be a better role model. Right. Okay. So if I'm, if I'm telling my, to me, that that was a big thing is, is having kids is if I tell them not to eat junk food and then I run to McDonald's anytime I'm like a little bit hungry, like I, I'm such a hypocrite. I can't even stand myself. Um, right. So yeah, yeah. I start to think of those bigger reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the willpower is a little bit easier because you can kind of keep uh, going back to a standard that you've set for yourself that wh- whether it's, you know, what, what example am I trying to set? Or is this worth my long-term health? And so now that's such a big thing yeah. that's like, yeah, I just want to be healthier. That's too big. So then you break it down into smaller steps. It helps the willpower. So the, your willpower holds you out for a month. Right. During that time, if you can give yourself small attainable goals, but all with the, the idea of going to that big goal at the end of just being a healthier person, then it's not a spurt because a spurt is like, I need to get in shape for the summer because then the summer comes and then it's gone. And all right. of a sudden you're like, okay, you know, I, I went to the beach and so now screw it. All bets are off. Right. I think too, you mentioned something about discomfort. And I think that's a big component of, um, we have a really good friend who, who is, um, who's the guy that started the whole cold plunge thing, like the wall. Uh, Wim Hof. Yes. Right. 
And the whole idea that like, we're all seeking that comfort and to sustain comfort, right? Like you go from an air conditioned house to an air conditioned car to an air conditioned office, you go from, right. And that, that idea of like, and I do think the older, like if I think about myself in my twenties, when I was really good about working out all the time and much more disciplined, it's like, I didn't mind being uncomfortable. I think when you age, you're sort of you're, all the things you're doing are to make yourself financially comfortable, right? It's to make yourself have more security, you have security for your kids. It's all about creating comfort. So then when you have to try to do something that's a life changer, you want to behave differently or your body to behave differently. It's like you've created this construct of like comfort and you don't want it to be uncomfortable. You know, uh, just on that one, my, uh, I've noticed this with my family members, my, my dad is retired and you'll see this a lot is that I think when we, I had three sisters, so there were four, six of us in a house and we always, my, my dad was okay financially, but he was very tight. So we always had like a small car and we yeah. always, everything was together. And so you have to accommodate everybody else. You're always in like a, some level of discomfort, you know, right. you don't yeah. get to eat what you want. You have to leave when you're in the middle of your show, you have to adapt yes. to all the people in the house. And what I've noticed is now we come back together. I'm 38. So we've all been out of the house for a little bit. And my dad is kind of like that stereotypical older person at the diner, but they're upset that it's, it's two degrees too warm or there's no spot for his jacket. And it's because now he's so used to his way. Mm -hmm. It's just him and my mom in the house that a small change is too much now. And this is where you can give kids some credit, you know, a 10 year old. They're, so you know, they are in the middle of napping and you grab them out of the car or out of the bed, throw them in the car. You're going to your sister's soccer practice and they're just relatively cool with it. Yeah. We're upset because they kind of, you know, you know, give you a huffy breath. But, you know, if somebody did that to me, I'm in the middle of my work day and get in the car. We're going to someone's practice that has nothing to do with you. You're like, what? the Right. And that's that the discomfort. And I've seen it, you know, as we get older, I think we are more in control. And when we lose a little bit of it and get dis, you know, out of comfort, um, it's very hard for us to go back to being like, like a kid that has to. <laughs> yeah, it is so true. Bend. All right. I totally derailed us. So tell me, okay, talk to me a bit more about, about your professional life and then we'll kind of get to um, some of the other stuff that I want to talk to you about, but just t- tell me how that transpired for you. And then that bridge to doing what you're doing now. Relatable is sponsored by TFA Soft Skills, your one-stop shop for workshops, coaching, speaking, and soft skills development. If you'd like to hire Teresa, visit www.tfasoftskills.com for more information. I competed in professional mixed martial arts. I kept working my way up. And um, yeah, I really just, my, my goals initially were just see see if I can do it, see how far I can go. Um, yeah. Really, I was just excited. I was like, I loved watching it so much. I was like, let me just see what it's like. Let me see if I can hang out in that arena for a little bit. And I, I think I, I actually outperformed my expectations, which I, in retrospect, I wish I had set my expectations higher because I think I would have just kept going where, I, but I think I had mentally been like, oh, you know, maybe I'll get to this point. And so I got past that and I was a little bit, uh, surprised. Um, but eventually, you know, I, I got an eye injury. Um, mm. I tore my retina. I actually tore it three times. So I tore it once and finally they repaired it. And I went back. I was like, they're like, you can fight again, you know, but we wouldn't recommend it. So I did. And I, I won a couple of fights, but then I tore it again. And they said, you know, you're just going to keep tearing it. And eventually you'll, you'll start to lose vision if you do that. And so that was actually the thing they, they I was like, you know, what are we talking about? This is going to be a little blurry. And you know, what it really was, is they said that you, you won't be able to drive anymore. Oh. And I was thinking, oh man, you know, that's, that's going to be pretty like un- Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of an important thing. And so my vision's fine right now. They just said it would keep happening. So, so I stopped competing and yeah, I, I kind of, like I said, I was going to go back into police work. Um, right. I ran into some, some bumps trying to apply to that. So it didn't happen smoothly. And so then I was looking at other careers and I went back to school to do air traffic control. Um, and I just realized like, I'm, I'm, I'm square peg round hole. I am trying to try to be someone I'm not. And eventually I, I, I realized I, I love the martial arts so much. That's where I should be working. That's where I should, I, I belong. And so uh, partnered up with a, with a buddy who had a big gym and he wanted to 
running martial arts school and we started doing it. And I, I learned the ropes from that role. I was managing the gym for like eight years and it grew and it, you know, I loved it. I love working with kids. I, I, I met my wife there. I, uh, you know, it, yeah. it, it, it was really life-changing. Um, and so now just recently I, I purchased the gym. So now it's mine. Now I have to learn the next level of aspect. How, yeah. how during that time, like when you stopped fighting and you kind of felt like, okay, I've got to do this next thing. And, and you talked about this, like in terms of the police Academy, but also, um, air, air traffic control. Like, did you feel like this isn't a real job? Like I have to do something that's more like substantive, what, you know, quote unquote. And, and what, tell me just a little bit about that process of getting like, okay with this is what I love doing. And I'm, I'm going to figure out a way for this to work in my life that financially supports what I want to do, but it's also what I love to do. Cause I think yeah, that's, that's a, a big thing. A, a lot huge of people jump. Think, right. <laughs> yes, it is. It's, li it's literally a leap of faith because you have to believe in yourself. Um, right. And I think that's kind of where um, a lot of um, the skills you, you, you get growing up that, that are important that, that you've built up the confidence that you can do things. That's literally like can do things because right. the things that are, I think are intimidating are it's something as simple as like, what type of insurance do we need? So we don't get sued. And I know it sounds like a small thing, but for somebody who just knows how to paint or, or wants to teach music, it's like, I don't know anything about insurance. And then, right. you know, you'll get into your own head with anxiety. You're like, well, I don't know insurance. I don't know that which computer, call the whole thing off. Right. And so I think having the confidence that you can figure things out mm -hmm. because you, where I ran into a lot of hesitation was, I don't know all the steps. I don't know, um, I can't tell you, I can't give you all the answers. And so the faith was that I can figure them out. Mm -hmm. I can find somebody who can help me figure them out. And so that was a big part of it. When you say like a, a substantive career, that was, you know, it's it, when you tell somebody, you know, especially when it's a small, like a, a brand new thing, you know, like, Hey, I, I'm mom, I'm going to be a musician. And she's <laughs> yeah. like, you haven't yeah. you don't play any instruments. <laughs> There's very little to like base yeah. all that confidence on. And so you, you build that up. And I think that over time by doing it organically, you know, you start to believe in yourself and people, eventually other people will start to believe in it a little bit. I think the, the hardest thing is understanding that oddball things can pay the bills. I right. think that, and, and it's a hard thing because it's easy to look at a job that's paying, okay, it pays 50,000. I show up 40 hours a week. I can do that. But when you're starting with a career about who knows what, I love gardening and I want to build exotic gardens for people. There's no nine to five. There's no recipe. There's no anything. You right. just have to start with, hey, I'm going to do a couple projects for free. Right. Then I'll do a couple projects for a couple bucks. And then you start to see, oh, maybe I can do this part time. And so, again, I, it's, it's like the other things. I, I usually think about trying to break those big, a big leap of faith yeah. into smaller more manageable tasks. And I think, you know, you talked about it early and I, it comes up a lot in the conversations that we have, which is if you are passionate about something and you love something and it, and it gets you out of bed, that shower test, like there's so much power in that. And so to listen to that voice and even when it's oddball, right. Even when it's something yep. different, um, I think, you know, it's, it's great developmentally for yourself, but then also you you'll find a way, right? If, if you, if you love it enough, you'll find a way. And I think and, and, people, well, you know, it's hard, you give in right to the, to what is stereotypically approved, you know, like approved or where people are like, Oh, what do you do? What do you do? You know, you get that, like the look or, you know, it's something you feel like you have to defend. And there's a value to that too. Sometimes people miss that is that if, you know, you, you can find, I, I had a job that was not paying a ton, but I was like selling insurance for government contracts. And it mm -hmm. was, I actually appreciate that because I could see how bad a job can be <laughs> when you're in a like cubicle, yeah. you're getting hung yeah. up, people are mad, you're even talking to them. 
And you're like, I'm not, people usually like to talk to me. Why, what am I doing this for? And so that, that's a cost. So you might be making a, a comfortable salary, but then there's a cost. And so then on the flip side, uh-huh. yeah, maybe you're making, you know, yeah. close to minimum wage by doing your, whatever, your lessons, your artwork, your music. Um, but at least, but you are happy all the time and you don't mind putting in extra hours to do it. And right. so um, I thought Dave Chappelle, uh, he had a, a great quote because he had to, something similar. He had to explain to his dad, uh, you know, hey, dad, I really want to be a professional comedian. And which, you know, I mean, we can all, as parents, you're like, are you sure? Have you thought this through? Right, right. And his thought was, you know, what is success? And success for him could be paying my bills and doing what I love. It didn't have to be $10 million, sold out arenas. It's, you know, am I, am I secure? Am I doing right. what I love? That's success for me. And so changing your definition of what success is, not, not to lower the bar, but to understand success doesn't always mean that you're going to be the, you know, selling out arenas. If your success for you can be happy, you have a home, you're secure and you're doing what you love. That's enough but for me. I think, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't say, I think this is an important part of, for you in terms of you just pulled the trigger in January. I think there's been at least two or three other times where you were very close to pulling the same trigger. Right. And <laughs> so for whatever reasons, right. I think, it's, it's easy to say, to be in the position of I've done it and here I am and we're right. Versus like there is Ajda and there is like, you know, stress and anxiety on, on the sort of the system to make the decision. Right. And so for whatever reasons, right. Whether it was a pandemic or perhaps it's, it's other factors that are out of your control. Right. And then, but knowing like this is eventually the goal. And so just, you know, sometimes the trade-offs, right? I, I'm, I'm a huge believer in trade-offs and having to like, nothing's for nothing. Like you, you, you have trade-offs that you have to, to consider or um, execute in order to get the thing that you want. And the thing that helped me with, with that in retrospect is that along the way, because you're right, like, you know, I, I, if I could have done this by myself, I would have done it eight years ago at the start. Right. But right. I didn't know how a business runs. I didn't know how much things cost. I didn't know a lot of things. Right. And so um, during the way I was working very hard in a lot of areas that I don't always know what's going to pay off. You know what I mean? Sometimes people get very transactional. Like, you know, if I'm whatever at this thing, marketing and talking to people, how much am I making for this? But eventually you're learning the, the soft skills. You're learning the, you know, the, the industry, and so then that leap of faith we talked about becomes a smaller leap because, okay, well, now I know how to sell a membership. Now I know how much things cost. Now I know how to manage a schedule of employees. And that leap of faith becomes smaller and smaller. It's still a leap. But, um, and, and sometimes I think like if I, you know, I, I would, of course, you know, want to tell myself, hey, you should do this sooner. You should have done this 10 years ago, you know, and, and some of that's true, but I think if I had done this 10 years ago, there might've been quite a few uh, roadblocks I would have hit or obstacles right. or things that, you know, would have derailed. I might've gone out of business three times. And so learning and struggling and working through these things. And, and it's not just in one thing. I mean, I take something from every job I've done right. that I can apply to what I'm doing now and building up those skills kind of builds your confidence in yourself. It makes the leap of faith not so big but I really do think it's strengthening yourself along the way so that you, yeah. and now I'm like, Oh, of course, this is an easy uh, jump. It's kind of how it should be. Right. It's like, it, I think the easier it is, then it feels like right time, right place. Right. When you're, when it's forcing something or where it doesn't feel right, not to say that you're not going to have that can work extra hours or there aren't going to be hardships. It's different than like, I'm forcing something unnaturally. I think it's a very subtle difference. Um, tell me about your positivity, right? Uh, you're a super positive guy, like ever since, I mean, every time I'm with you, it's funny, you guys were just visiting not that long ago. And after you left, Paul's like, I love being around that guy. Like you have just this like very infectious, positive energy about you. So is that something that you were born with? Is that something you've cultivated? Tell me a little bit about where that comes from and how it served you. 
There's a little bit of column A, column B. I, I yeah. think um, um, it, it, it is a little bit easier for me to see things positively. Yeah. Um, but I, th- I think, it, you know, I grew up with three sisters and they argued enough for like a lifetime. And so I was usually kind of the peacemaker or the one making jokes to kind of lighten the tension. Yeah. So when things get rough, I'm more likely to joke around. Humor, so, yeah. it, you know, sometimes it's, you know, it's not always great. If I'm having a serious discussion with my wife and I, and I make a joke, I have to kind of, you know, calm that down. But, but as, you know, things get really stressful, um, you know, I am likely to keep it lighthearted. Um, and I think that kind of helps me keep things, you know, keep a level head, but it is something to cultivate. I mean, I, I definitely think that you can kind of coach yourself over time. It helps. Mm-hmm. My, my wife is, is big into that stuff too. Right. Right. Um, but, but you can recognize it in, in what you're saying and what you're talking about. Um, are you complaining about something? Are you, are you, you know, you, you don't even realize it sometimes when you're talking trash about somebody, you, you might be, you know, some, you had an interaction with somebody and, and before you know it, you're, you're kind of talking negatively about what they're doing. Right. And if you, if you stay positive enough, you notice it, you notice it when someone else does it, you notice when you do it, eventually it kind of becomes a, an icky feeling. And it's not really like, sometimes people think like I've talked to people about it. It's like, Hey, why, why are you complaining about all this stuff? And they usually think that they're just, you know, to, to not do that is to not be, to be dishonest, but usually there's a, um, a, a better way to think about things that's still honest, but it, it keeps you positive in, in, and you look at things in the right way, because the truth is most of that negativity is, is not productive. I, I remember asking my mom one time as a kid, I was like, we were hiking. My dad made us hike. You know, we did backpack and stuff. And I was like, mom, you're hiking up too. How come you're not complaining? And she said, she was like, you know, uh, I could complain, but it's not going to make us get up there any quicker. And I still remember that like now, 30 years later, I'm like, right. She's right. It's, it's just as hard if we complain right. or don't. Um, right. Right. And, I generally kind of think of it that way is that I can complain about it, but how about we just get down to what the problem is? Yeah. It's, it's helped a lot with, with tackling very difficult things. Yes. Agree. And I, I feel like it's one of those, you know, there's so much, it's almost like the kind of weight management market. Like there's a lot out there now on like happiness and the power of positivity and mindset and growth mindset. And I think, you know, there's a lot of, you know, well, people just have it or they don't. And I I think that's not right. I mean, I think there's maybe some of us are more like have an easier time getting there, but I do think it is a intentional practice of, you know, I'm going to be positive, you know, intentionally positive and try to have that be the way that I interact with people versus, you know, the other way. Uh, And I mean, I think it is hardwired, you know, not hardwired, but it takes some real digging because, yeah. you know, if, if that's how your parents interacted, you know, right. your mom, right. you know, dug on dad and dad, you know, said something about mom, you know, you've had that since a child, right. that it's hard maybe for you to interact later in life and you can do it. It's just a little bit easier for some people. So I, I generally tell people to give yourself a little grace, you know, as you're working through things because you have your own set of circumstances. And so just keep it on on your situation, not you versus other people's situation. One of the things I wanted to chat with you about, um, you recently were, um, and, and what actually somewhat what prompted me reaching out to talk to you on the, on the podcast is on Facebook, you've been d- doing these little public service announcements. <laughs> I don't know what to call them. PSAs, little like uh, mini segments on, um, your sobriety and like your decision to be sober and that people ask you all the time, how have you done that? And, you know, what advice do you have for me? If it's something I want to do. And one, I want to hear about for you, what prompted that and, and tell us a little bit about that journey. The the one thing I want to say in terms of the reaction to it, right. When I watched people reacting to you and and comments, and I listen to a lot of podcasts. And so, um, it's interesting how much it comes up in terms of people and how, and, and like habit, a habit in their life, right. And whether it is additive or it detracts and how I think there's, and it was your video messages and sort of this exchange of information that people are having with you on Facebook that I think is so interesting that, 
it's almost like what I feel like magazines and the media have done to say like, this is what beautiful is and everybody's aspiring to be beautiful, right? I feel like there's this thing with alcohol and with drinking that there's a, a sort of a false narrative that everybody out there is drinking and partying or not even partying, right? That it's this like socially uh, easy, acceptable, like they're, you know, I, the way, and I think a lot of it is media, but I do think it's all like in your twenties, people, you know, you're drink, you're drinking, you're hanging out. And then it's like the habit doesn't evolve. So I think there's like, in my opinion is what, and, it, and I never thought about this way until I saw you talking and having people react to it. I was like, holy shit, there's like a whole industry that's making us think that you need it, that it's relevant, where actually there's a lot of people that are sober and that aren't drinking yeah. and that have chosen that path. Right. And so I just think it's interesting. And I'm really curious about for you, you know, what prompted the decision and what, and what the journey has been like, like, I'm sure it hasn't been entirely easy if that's been a part of your social life. Yeah. That's um, yeah. It's been, so I, I started doing um, those videos after. So I mean, let's see. So I started doing videos after about two years of not drinking. And the reason I hadn't really said it because I felt like I was still like doing the journey. So I didn't want to be like, Hey guys, you shouldn't drink for this reason. And then someone sees me at the bar a month right. later and like, Hey, what the hell was all that? Right. Um, so I, you know, I was kind of private about it. And then also just socially, I had <laughs> the majority of my hanging out and socializing was around alcohol. So I don't want to come out and kind of belittle all my friends at the right. same time. It's like holier than thou. Um, cause I, I actually, and, and that was something I tried to be very clear about is that I don't have any issues with everybody else drinking because that, that's awesome. If you have it, I have a problem with it. Um, and you know, the, the example I use was, you know, some people have a problem with cake. I don't feel the need to swear off cake because I don't feel like I have something initial. I'll have some and then I'll leave it. Um, <laughs> I won't eat it until I'm passed out. Um, right. so, right. so I kind of, um, looked at it. That's why it took some time talking to people about it. But um, initially, I I noticed that um, initially it was to support my wife. My wife was trying to make a, a big change. And she was going to, you know, she was taking on this big endeavor. And it was three months of like all these disciplined things. And I just, I, I knew that if she wasn't drinking for three months, I kind of had like a crossroad there. I was like, I could, you know, be drinking on the couch, you know, doing all this while she is living the best life and journaling, meditating, yoga and eating clean. And I'm eating Cheetos and drinking beer. And I was right. like, that is not like a, a good split there. And I, believe it or not, I was a little bit defiant in my head. I was like, you know, I'm not, I'm not on this journey. Right. I'm not doing that. Right. Why? You right. know, and I was almost going to double down and like, let me just drink twice as much and be independent. <laughs> I'll drink for you too. Yeah. yeah. And, and luckily my wiser self was like, hang on, let's be supportive. Let's take a little break. Um, and at the same time, I, I knew that I've been, I'd been trying to grow. We were, we, we had just purchased a house. You know, I was trying to grow my, my, the gym, the, the martial arts Academy. I had, we had a two-year-old, you know, there were a lot of things that were like the big things in life you're trying to do. And yeah. you, the more you try to do more in that area, the more like a hangover holds you back. And so, you know, you, to me, I felt like during the week, I'd take five steps forward and then the weekend I'd take five steps back. And I just could see like, there's like, it became more obvious the, the disconnect and what I was doing. Um, and then I felt like I was, I, I noticed cause it's after the holidays. I stopped on January 1st, the holidays, Thanksgiving, all those, you, you go to a lot of parties and events. And right. I just noticed I was drinking more light beers than, then I could count. I was like, why, why do I need another one? If I had 10, right. is 11 going to make a difference? And I just noticed I wasn't getting what I wanted out of alcohol anymore. Um, so I took a, a three month break. That was my initial thing. Um, and, and three months was hard. Um, I just noticed that when you remove it, and this was kind of one of the big things that I think people should focus on is that when you remove something that is addictive or bad habit or something you start to get feedback right away like uh, about whatever it is for, for a lot of people it's like their anxiety and maybe it's social anxiety I noticed that like I'd go out to a bar or, or, or just an event a social event and I'd feel an intense need to drink 
and you know you can give into it or you can take a minute and just get the new information You're like man this is interesting mm -hmm. I, I think i have some social anxiety here like <laughs> And, and why is yeah. that? Is that from right. high school? Is that from college? Is that, do I not know how to have a conversation without being drunk? Do I have to practice this? And to me, that's like the really good stuff. I, I know it's, it's painful because then you have to go to a cookout and not know how to talk to people and feel weird. So it's painful, but you can start to feel, figure out your own issues that are going on. Why? And as you start to tackle those one at a time, um, like, can I have a good time without drinking? <laughs> and that's a serious question. Like right. I, I know like a cookout, you know, a cookout. Can I, can I do a cookout and enjoy this without drinking? What's the point? <laughs> and that's how I felt at some point. I was like, what's the point of right. sitting around right. the fire if we're not having beers? Um, and so you slowly deconstruct those and that's where you really start to make some, some progress on yourself. Um, to the second part of your question, as, as I got to two years and I kind of started talking to people about it, um, I noticed a lot of people were trying to make that change or had recently made that change. Or uh, I even noticed that people in their life, their significant other, their family member or something like that was, they're trying to support them. And I realized that it's something a lot of people are, are working on just in, in behind the scenes, because like you said, it is so commonplace that drinking is how we socialize. That's, I mean, I, I noticed it just very commonly that, you know, you go to someone's house, you bring a bottle of wine. <laughs> You know right. what I mean? You, right. you, you, if you want to talk about something, you, you talk about it over drinks. Um, and yeah. so to, to remove that and then still have all the, the good stuff left socializing with your friends, having a conversation, having a cookout, um, is tricky. And so I think you have to unlearn some stuff, learn some more things about yourself. Um, and you know, there's, there's a formula to it. You know, you can follow steps, but, right. um, I think the big thing is taking the time to learn more about yourself. Was it ever problematic for you, like where you felt like it was really interfering with your life and your right? Was that was there anything, you know, that happened? I, rock bottom is is a maybe too you know common of a term, but I'm curious. Like I know, um, you know, Courtney going on her um, on that program was like an instigator, but I'm curious if there was any other input that you were like, mm, maybe. Yeah, I mean. There are plenty of times, you know, passing out, you know, not, not, not being able to get home and things like that. But um, I actually, I had thought, you know, I was like, I'm kind of a, a positive drunk. This is okay. You know, when I drink, I hug right. people and I right. laugh and I might tell people I love them that I, you know, I wouldn't normally that like, right. I wasn't getting into fights and things like that. But um, what I think I did notice is that, um, and this is something that took a long time is that if I wasn't achieving what I thought life could be in yeah. terms of, you know, the, the big things, the, the family, the career, the, the stability, um, the relationship, you, you kind of get a deep, I don't know, a sense of, you know, just something lacking. Yeah. And I didn't know it at the time, but that would be when I would want to drink is there's something missing here. You know, there's supposed to be more to life. And I feel bad about it. And, and so yeah, what yeah. my brain would say, hey, stop by, grab a six pack on your way home um, and you'll feel better. And I would do that and I would feel better. And, you know, but what would happen is that all those things that you really wanted out of life, whatever, you know, getting your finances together, you're like, right. Man, I'm in debt and this is never going away. Well, if I have a six pack, I'll stop thinking about it. Whereas you can yeah. actually take the time to feel terrible to look at your bank statements, look at all your credit cards, put it on a spreadsheet. And once you start doing that, maybe you all of a sudden have, just have a plan to get out of debt. And right. if you've done that, all of a sudden, you, your drive to drink has just dropped by like 20%. And then maybe, who knows what it is? You got an issue with your, your wife or your dad and you got to hash out something. You know, like, man, I really need to tell Courtney about such and mm -hmm. such. It's like, nah, just let it go but I'll grab a six pack on the way home. Mm -hmm. And so as you avoid, as you, as you don't have the six pack, you have the discussion. Now, some people, they, when it's, when it's a short spurt, they're like, I'll just make it three months. I won't have the discussion and I won't drink and I won't <laughs> take care of my finances. Right. In the three months, you just get it all in. And that's why people, I think usually get into that loop where 
Like I will have my willpower for one month, but then they don't do any of the work to figure out why am I feeling like the need to drink. And eventually now I felt like I've dealt with enough of those things that my relationship's in a healthy place. I'm happy with my family. Our finances are in a good place. My career is in a good place. There's always, there's still struggles. I mean, don't get me wrong. There's always stuff like that. But without all of those things, there, there isn't that, that drive to go have a drink. Now, you know, from time to time, I, you know, I'm like, man, it would be nice to have a cold beer right now. But that's kind of passing. That's kind of like how I feel about having a Slurpee. I'm like, oh yeah, I'd love to have a Slurpee. But I don't feel like a, <laughs> I need to have Slurpees yeah. until I can't remember where I am. Yeah, that was, that was actually in my next question was just, geez, is it as hard, is it as, is it as hard and as it was in the beginning to not do it, right? Do you still find that like in social situations where it was very much a habit and we talked about the social piece of this, like, is it, is it is still a moment where you have to kind of like, whatever that alternative move is, right? So you don't feel so yeah. uncomfortable or is that dissipated a lot for you? If you'd like to advertise with Relatable, please email us at info at tfasoftskills.com for more information. Mostly it has, but I still feel it. Like there's, because I, I explained this to, I've explained this before where if everybody's doing something, it's a very, it's a social thing to, to do it too. So if everybody's gonna have a piece of cake, I, I can exclude myself from the group and, you know, and then that makes everyone feel like crap, like, oh, well, I didn't want to have one. And now you're making right. me feel bad. Um, but by partaking with everybody, you're showing, hey, I'm part of the group. So that was hard for me to do uh, that part. Um, and usually I just kind of have a, a, you know, I'll bring, I have fake beers. I do those, you know, they're non-alcoholic beers or you have a drink. And those things usually calm everybody else down. Like, how come you're not drinking? Like, I am, I have one right here. Um, but better, I think, at, at a long-term uh, thing is I used to think it made you different in a bad way is that everyone see, Oh, you're not like us. And that's a bad thing. Um, but if, if people ask you, Oh, I don't, I don't drink. It's, it can be a, an interesting thing about you. It can be mm -hmm. a unique thing. Mm -hmm. that, you, you know, and it's all depending on you know, how you present it. Yeah. If, you, if you have any element of judge, a sniff of judgment, people will crucify you. But if you, yeah, if, yeah, if it's not for me, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing better without it. Um, then everyone kind of just takes a second look like, oh, that's interesting. You decided. And then and I noticed that, like with my friends group, a lot of them, we were college friends. Every time we got together, we, we just got hammered. That was just what we did. Right. And as, as one person stops drinking, everyone kind of looks at them like, interesting. You decided to do that. Okay. And then two people stop. And then everyone's like, well, Maybe, maybe I should. And, and it's, it's so interesting. if you can change your lens that it makes you, some of those things make you interesting that, it, that everybody zigs and you zag, that's, that's an okay thing. And it takes a little while to feel like that's okay. Right. Right. And I think the whole idea of like, and it's so true, it's such like the food and the booze thing. Like we can, so it's so funny, uh, Paul and I, and like you, Courtney, like we have similar conversations without even knowing it, but like the cake thing is maybe much more my issue, right? The food thing of like, that's my avoided behavior is if I don't want to deal with something and I don't want to think about something or I don't want to feel something, food is sort of my thing. Um, I like drinking, but it's not, it's not that, you know, whereas I think the kind of the medicinal component of it is more Paul, right? Like I would, I'm going to go have a beer. Cause that's just going to, I don't want to, I'll They're do with that. Calm me down. Take yeah. the edge off. So that I did like identifying that and knowing, and then to your point of like, you know, can you sit in it and then figure it out versus not medicate? You know, it's, it's a, it's a very, it's difficult, especially when it's like an ingrained habit and, you know, life can be hard. <laughs> and I think you said sit in it. Um, I think that's something that people, because like it goes back to what we're saying about comfort. Yeah. Is that if you're used to being comfort all the time, that it can you sit in anxiety for a few seconds? And it might just be a couple of seconds that, that hey, I, I just need to be stressed out and 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 experience it. And, and I, I just talked about it with someone about grief, is that if you have grief that you haven't felt. It might be every time you think about your, your, your father who passed, 
you drink. And so then you, then it goes away. Right. And I was like, yeah, bro, you know, it's okay to be sad. It, that's, that's the way it, you should be sad. Right. And just let that happen. And once you allow yourself to feel that or whatever, have the discussion or, you know, a yeah. common one is like a workplace situation. Like my job yeah. sucks. So I drink. And like, well, if you fix your job, then you won't have to drink, <laughs> you know? And it's like, and, what's the root source? Yeah. Going out. Yes. And, yeah. and I like what you said about um, medicinal. I think that's a big thing because yeah. my wife drinks and she just does it <laughs> for enjoyment. You know, and it's not that she has a stressful day and she's going to drown it away. And so that's fine for, for her. And I think everyone has their own thing. Some people, you know, it's, it, it, there's a lot of uh, vices people have, and some people can handle them just right. for fun. Right. Uh, you know, an easy one is gambling is that some people can gamble and play poker for fun. Some people can't stop no matter what. And that one, and, and that's, that's kind of how I try to think about it is that, are you in control of this? Um, or is it in control of you? Yeah. And that's when you know. All right. I, I've already taken up a lot of your time. I have just a couple of questions. One um, that's that time. A, a little bit self-serving um, on the soft skills front, which I know that obviously in your role as a teacher and now as a business owner, there's like some inherent obvious uh, soft skills that are going to be important for you, right? In terms of influence and relationship building. I am curious though, given your students and what you see and observe both, you know, from, you said you taught, you have, you work with people from four to 64. So I'm curious the intersection of point of what you do within martial arts and that intersection of what I think is an important part of soft skills is confidence. And so, you know, you talked about being at a party and having the, the like confidence or the comfort level to have conversations without booze. Right. So I, I'm curious what you're seeing, um, within the people that you work with, with like within your clients, like what are, what are some of the soft skills that you think are critical and that people need to be focused on developing based on your observations and what you're seeing? To, and you mean to, to run a business, to manage that many personalities, to, to I think to be life. like, to go bold, I would say to be successful in your life. Right. Cause I, I believe wholly that they're critically important as important as someone's technical skills. Right. So as someone's building out their, if they're a math major, if they're, you know, chemistry, if they're, um, you know, whatever your trade is and your discipline is, you need those technical skills. But I would say they need to be augmented by what I consider to be just as important. And that's like the soft skill space of communication, yeah, I mean, collaboration, all that kind of stuff. I think um, it's a fantastic question. Um, I think, believe it or not, um, I think it's the soft skill I think is most important is being likable. Mm -hmm. um, and that sounds like something that's just, um, that's like God given, you know what I mean? We all know like the varsity athlete, whoever was super popular and th those people, it, maybe it was God given, you know what I mean? You know, they, they're, they're just good looking. Charismatic, good right? Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, we get all kind of resentful about that person. Um, but I, I think that, especially as we get older, um, we recognize it's not all about who can run the fastest, um, but it's, it's how people make you feel. And so, I mean, the, the Dale Carnegie book, How to Win Friends and Influence yeah. People is a, is a right. fantastic one, um, especially because it's so short. Kids will like to read it, yeah. anybody will read it. But I try to point those out um, in my kids' classes a lot. I, I notice myself kind of going back to some of those things. Um, is how you make other people feel. And so, like, I, I think most people will attest um, that in their workplace, that they, they like working with someone who makes them feel good. I mean, it's, right. it's hard to it's hard to disagree with that point. And so, you know, if you're talking about somebody who's whatever a chemistry major and is trying to ingratiate themselves into a new role as a as a management or whatever, um, yeah, you know, all all the different chemistry lab stuff you need to know, but right. do people like you? And so most people just throw their hands like, who cares about that? But to have people work and cooperate with you, you have to learn some of those soft skills. And a lot of that is respecting other people, um, listening to other people. Um, and, and, it, and you don't have to be good at it. I, I mean, you, you just learn you like a, a great one. Courtney is just uh, my wife just talked to me about being a better listener. 
it's hard to do. And really you have to ask questions and not keep telling people your part. <laughs> and so, so it's, yeah. it's fairly easy when you do small things because, and I think it's easy because there's such a scarcity of it, especially in a workplace where someone genuinely asks, how are you doing? And then can remember something you said two days ago about how you were struggling and then ask you, Hey, I know you said your mom was sick. Is she feeling better? What happened with that? And people, it, it's crazy because that's such a, to me, that's such an easy thing to do. I know. It's a throwaway thing. You can just like, <laughs> you know, you can write, hey, ask about their mom. And then people are blown away. Like, I can't believe you cared about my dying mother. And you're like, yeah, that's the big stuff. And so I guess the hardest thing is to be able to pause. I know with, with I have like, I have 200 students right now. So we have like 40 kids in and they're all asking about their next promotion or this kick or they right. want to tell me something they did and then I have 30 adults coming in and they want to and so sometimes you're navigating everyone and what happens is some kid wants to tell you something and you end up missing it three classes in a row and they, they you know they, they get upset so you have to have some level of some systematic way as it gets bigger to have that discussion where somebody wants to talk to you you can you can message me you can do this because it, there is a limit to, to how much it's you do. Just but, one of you, yeah. But yeah, and, and I I used to think that it was a, a limit, a finite skill. You could only you could only care about two hundred people. Um, but if you make it slightly systematic, where every so often you, you I'm going to message these ten people from my company, and you message right. those ten. Hey, how's this going? And, and you just follow up. You would be blown away at how many people you can actually care about in some meaningful level. Um, so to me, think, building up that, that relationship with your coworkers or your team, which at wherever you are, people value that way yeah. more than, than you would imagine. I think too, for you, what you're going to find is, is leading through people, right? So there's, because you can't scale, right? So you're, you are a human. So what happens is the way your methodology for approaching students, your methodology for being likable, your methodology for caring, right? You start to cultivate that in the people that work with you and, and for you, right? And so then you, that's an extension of you. And it's hard because you feel like that's not me, you know, directly connecting with this human, but you really are, right? And that's the great thing about leadership is you get to start to cultivate that in a way. And now that it's your own business and your company, you can really impact that. That's, that's a million dollar piece of advice, just so you know, because <laughs> we were just doing that. And I hadn't even thought that's what we were doing, but yeah. we, we, we uh, bought the gym. We had our leadership team come together yeah. and we talked about what are we all about and what makes people yeah. enjoy being here. And it was a lot of this stuff, um, but we were talking to him about, you know, how can you guys do that? And maybe I can handle 200, but if you can take 25 people and make them feel good, then right. we can double in size. And, and it um, ends up being this reciprocal. This is what people don't understand. It's reciprocal, right? So if I make you feel good, I see that you feel good and it makes me feel good. It's just a, it's a, it's a little bit of a, a switch, like a reversal of what you think is sort of naturally like I, you know, not that everybody's inherently me, 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 but it is a little bit of a, just take a minute and put that other person first and yes. see what happens. And you'll find it's, it is pretty, it is uh, impactful. Like immediately you'll see it. Yeah. I noticed um, just being around other people who have some of those mentalities yeah. um, makes my life a lot easier. And for me, I just know I have to be around these people all day, every day. Yeah. And so that if I have someone who's toxic, um, we have to address it. Cause I don't want to be around you for the next 10 years. <laughs> I'm going to, let's address this yeah. now. Right. And let's make it better. And so it's, it's helped me a lot in my everyday life is to start having those conversations and make people more positive Yeah, because that's, that's what my life is being around those people. When you think we've covered a fair amount of territory, when you think about your, um, you know, we didn't talk a lot about your young adult life, but I am curious just in terms of your own path and giving yourself advice. Right. So when you think about how you were as a young person or even entry law, like right, right when you graduated from school and you were on your path to being a professional athlete, like what advice all the way to where you are now and the experiences that you have, what, what advice would you give to young Zach and, and how would you 
talk to him in a way that could make the path maybe a little bit easier or, you know, um, not that I mean, I, I'm a big believer in you got to go through the, the obstacles because I think it helps build character. But certainly like maybe there's something that would be sound advice to help it be a little bit smoother or something that you're like, Oh, if I had known that, that would have been really helpful. Um, there's a lot of those uh, that I could think of. Um, yeah. So one, one that I, I really like, this is something I actually channeled recently for, for my team was uh, I remember I, I was in a couple of different schools from, from elementary, middle, I went to two different middle schools and I went to two different high schools. So within like a three or four year period, I was in like five different schools and new schools are very challenging. Everyone's yeah. trying to figure out where you fit in the social hierarchy. And are we making fun of you? Are we looking up to you? What are we doing with you? Um, and so, you know, you, you feel very, uh, I don't know, assessed um, and you, you're stressed about how your hair is, who your friends are, you, you know, what your, what shoes you're wearing. And um, what I think I realized is, is kind of a, a painful process was that the, there's a, a time when the kids who were nice to me were unpopular, you know? And so they were not the coolest kids, but they wanted a friend. And so, but I knew that being friends with this, you know, the, the dorky crew right. was like social suicide. And so I could hang out with the people who are nice to me and be unpopular. And it, it was, it's a tough thing in middle school where you're like, which group do middle I fit in with? Brutal. You know, which, which one am I going to put in with? It's like choosing like a fraternity in college or something. <laughs> and um, yeah. what I realized was sometime like in high school is that I had, I finally had the friends that I, I got along with and it, you know, some were cool, some were not. But to me, we had fun hanging out with. And eventually we just owned it. We're like, look, we're gonna, we're not gonna try to latch on to someone else's party. We're not gonna try to work our way into someone else's group. We're gonna have as much fun as we're having. And the crazy thing was we were having a good time. We were nice, you know, we were funny. And you know, all of a sudden people started wanting to hang out with us. And it was it was shocking to me because it was like I kept trying to fit in with another group. Mm -hmm. And I was like, we can just create our own group and we can do what we want to do and we can, you know, and we'll, we'll start it. And so I've carried that through me, with me in life. I, I, I was thinking about it, about the, this neighborhood. I was like, man, I wish they had a good wrestling program out here. I wish, you know, I could put, maybe we could move to a neighborhood where they have a good sports program. It's like, why don't we start contributing here and make it so that we, I love we create that. it? You know, yeah. I wish this neighborhood had the kids hang out more. It's like, why don't you start doing it? And, and to me, that helped a lot because you can keep jumping around. I wish this job was more positive. I'm going to find a job that's positive. You can usually create it where you are and can kind of control it. And then you're at the, at the yeah. foundation of it. And, and from there, then everything is better. And then everybody wants a part of what you're doing. And so to a, to a, to a kid, like if they want something, if they want their, man, I wish this school had a, you know, whatever it is. I wish they had a, uh, a board game club, right? <laughs> Play yeah. one. Get yeah. your friends to join the board game club with you. Um, and as you start doing it, I think you notice other people are inspired by you and they want to do what you're doing. And I think that's the way to game life. It's the trick is, is if you, so you build it yeah. and they will come. It's so funny. I, my, kid, my middle kid was just telling me that him and some of his buddies wanted to like start a rap club at, at in the high school because there isn't one and they're not doing it. I'm like, you should do it. Like, you know, it's just, you know, I think it's such great advice, especially for things. It's so easy to sit right and say that should be this way and that should be that way. And like to be a commentary versus like, am I effectively <laughs> making change? Am I doing something about it? Uh, it's not always easy and you don't always have the control to do it. But I think that mindset of that you can and you can create in a way your own destiny, I think is really, really powerful. That's awesome. And I think there's a, a level of confidence that, you know, is instilled over time, you know, just by yeah. doing positive things with kids. But yeah. where a rap club, of course, of course, you will get made fun of at some level. Yes, right. For making a rap club. But that's OK, because you should have the confidence to be like, Look, I do whatever I want. I like rap. If you don't like it, go create a country music club. Right. All right. And and eventually, once people realize you don't care what they think, mm -hmm. in, in, in the best way possible, you don't care what yeah. they think, then they lay off. And then all of a sudden, 
you create the rap club and you do something cool where you have, hey, we're doing a rap club, we're gonna do a rap party. And then you're the one who's hosting the party. And pretty soon, all those kids who don't even like rap music, like, hey, you mind, can I come to that rap party? Right. right. And, you know, and, and you have your things and eventually everybody else will come around if you're confident enough about it, enthusiastic about it enough. And if they don't, it's not for them and it's not about them, not in a negative way, but it's not about you. This is me and my three friends and we really like rap music. So uh, our field trip is to the rap concert. We're gonna have a rap party. We have intramural rap competitions and um, everybody has, uh, you know, and yeah. And then you just, you just build yeah. up from there. And if nothing else, you have the experience of building a club. You can put it on your resume. Right. Yep. <laughs> when yeah. it comes to something else that's maybe more significant in life, uh, you know, you're like, hey, we want to create this, this group uh, in college or this group within my workplace. You yeah. trace it back. You're like, remember that time I made a rap club back in middle school? It's the same thing. <laughs> and, but you can still yeah. pull those lessons. So anyway, my advice is create yeah. the rap club. Um, and I know and I'm going to have listen. fun with it. <laughs> I think that plus the authenticity, right? It's kind of like that authenticity of something that's uniquely yours. Plus the, the like passion, those two things, you're just undeniable. And I think and you can't, you know, you can't argue with it. People will sniff it out. If you don't really right? love rap and you make the rap club, they're like, <laughs> you're just doing this to be cool. <laughs> yeah. and people don't like that. Yeah. But if you authentically really love rap yeah. and you're not just doing it because you're trying to be cool you're trying to get some credibility with somebody and you authentically love it, then people, people notice that. I know. And, so true. and you don't have to defend it. Like if somebody's like, you, do you really like rap? You're like, don't worry. I got the credentials. I can tell you every lyric from every album. I got my club. I'm good man. Here. Yeah. And I'm at peace with that. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, thank you so much. This has been a joy. I hope we uh, tackled everything that you were hoping that we talked about. I know that um, there's probably we'll a lot more we, we didn't even uncover, but I really appreciate it. It's been uh, it's been really interesting. I think you've got a lot of different uh, pieces to your journey that I think are applicable in a lot of different ways. So thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Awesome. I love it. And I, I feel like I already gained some stuff just having this conversation. I'm going to give all the kids my rap club speech today. <laughs> That's good. You should for sure. Well, thank you, thank you very much for having me. And I appreciate uh, everything that you've done for all these people. Thank you, Zach. I feel so motivated after we talk. Uh, I love what you said about figuring out your why behind any program that you're trying to start because willpower only gets you so far. I loved hearing about your experience with sobriety. I felt like you were so honest and it was really helpful. And it's definitely made me think twice about going for that second or third piece of cake <laughs> and actually sit with my feelings for a bit. And your counsel to create your own change. Uh, if you're frustrated or there's something you're not happy with in your life, you have the opportunity to change it or even create it. Relatable is sponsored by TFA Soft Skills. You can check out our website at www.tfasoftskills.com for more information on how we can best support your soft skills needs. Until next time, this is Teresa Friedman. Stay connected.